And now that, uh, now that Pierre Legendre had, has really set the stage for the rest of the course, we can turn to those techniques that are specifically devoted to the analysis of spatial structures where the geographic location of the sites are explicit. And the first one of those will be the Mantel Corellogram. Okay, Mantel Corellogram. What is, what is Mantel and what is a Corellogram? Of course, to explain, uh, I'll have to f uh, first to present those two notions to you uh, so that everything is clear. First of all, what is a Corellogram? A Corellogram is a graphical representation of spatial or temporal, for that matter, temporal correlations between sites computed for a range of distance classes. And these spatial or temporal correlations measure how much the sites resemble their neighbors of increasing spatial distances, meaning how does a site resemble its closest neighbors, and then its second closest neighbors in the second distance class, and so on and so, and so forth, until you have covered your whole sampling area. Now, how does it work? I'll first present an intuitive example with actually uh, calculating the correlation not in the appropriate way, but in a way that is close to it, simply that you understand how it works um, with something that you already know. Let's say you have a simple case where you got data from a transect and you are looking for the values of a, uh, 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 of a single variable. Here, for instance, the density of soil cores in grams per cubic centimeters. Let's say you may have, for some obscure reason, uh, it does, it's not important here, uh, along that transect you will have such fluctuating values of densities. Maybe you have some kind of mosaic of different types of soil that may produce something like this. Uh, a correlogram will compare the values of density for this example by progressively out, uh, offsetting, displacing the series with respect to itself. So let's say just for now that we do this with the Pearson's correlation coefficient because actually one of those coefficients that are used Moran's I is very close to it. So I'll stick with, uh, with uh, Pearson's correlation coefficient because everybody here knows what a simple correlation is. So at lag zero, I have simply here twice that this vector of uh, density that uh, uh, the two vectors are completely superimposed. At lag zero, it means, of course, that the correlation is one. You correlate a vector with itself. And now, as you see, we increase the lag. So I shift this series with respect to the other by one uh, unit. It's simple in this case. It's simply the, uh, uh, I have this, uh, this series of values shifted by one value along my transect. If I have taken one point every meter, it would be shifted by one meter. And I recompute Pearson's R correlation coefficients. Of course, I lose one value at each end of the series. And so I get a correlation which is lower than the other one. And I go on with this procedure. I shift again, shift again, shift again each time computing my correlation. And then I display those correlations. Of course, I have to stop at some point because uh, the lack of, uh, of values uh, here 
as you see, I, I have stopped at like 15 for this example here because I have only five common values left to compute my correlation. And of course, uh, at some point, you have to stop. Uh, so I, I, in the situation that I have here with this periodic periodicity in my data, after that, I shall draw my correlations with respect to the lags. And this is my correlogram. This correlogram shows you, starting with 1, that at lag 1 and 2, we still have positive correlation, meaning that at a range of 2 meters, uh, values tend to be rather similar to their neighbors. But if I go uh, farther down in uh, my lags, you see, for instance, here that at lags 5, uh, 4, 5, and 6, I have negative correlations, meaning that for the original data, I have reached a point where the, the high values here and here and there, well, there you, we, we lose them, correspond, in fact, to the, well, when you have lagged uh, at some point here, correspond to low values. So this means negative correlations. You have uh, displaced your series uh, to such a point where, uh, where positive values here, or at, at a lag of five, if you take any positive values here, or, well, if you center them, but any high values here, you're likely to have a correspondence with the low value, and the reverse is true as well for the next uh, bump or trough in, this, in the series. So. The correlogram here shows you the relationship among sites for those lags. Lag 1, lag 5. And of course, when you are again in phase with the periodicity that I had in my fictitious example, then you go back to positive correlation. And here you see, uh, you, uh, you appreciate the distance between the bumps. You'll say, well, uh, superficially, this looks like the, the data themselves. Of course, in real cases, uh, situations are not always that clear. And often, you may not have necessarily such kind of structures as well. And there is a chapter and a section in Pierre's book explaining this in more detail with examples of different spatial structures and how they occur uh, or how they are visible or they can be derived from correlograms. You get the point? OK. This was for one dimension. We had a transect. But it can be generalized to two dimensions. With two dimensions, you compute a matrix of Euclidean distances among sites. And I mean among the geographical position locations of the sites, not among the response data. Okay? So uh, Euclidean distance in this specific case corresponds to geographic distance. Okay? If you have uh, an XY, coordinate, uh, XY coordinates in meters or kilometers, then Euclidean distance between any two points gives you the geographic distance or straight line distance between those two points. And this is what we want. Because what we do after that, we have to have lags, as in my linear example. Uh, then to obtain those lags, we have to group those distances in two classes. For instance, here I have an excerpt of a matrix of Euclidean distances. And I can uh, set lags, for instance, from, uh, I don't remember where the limits are. This is not very important here, but I think below 1. Uh, meter distance between the point. This was distance class one. As you know, uh, well, yes, it looks like that. So uh, here, everything that is below one gets class distance one. It's a ra the first range. Uh, the first neighbors are defined in the radius of one meter around each point on your sampling surface. And then the distances between one and two meters get distance class two in this simple example here. So everything that is between 1 and 2 
uh, not including the limit, I think, uh, gets value 2. And so on. So we, in this example, we had the uh, fourth distance classes between three and four, well, third distance between two and three meters, and then fourth distance class here. And now, from that, that information, going back to your values in the response uh, matrix for your data, you can do the same, meaning computing, correlating the, the uh, the values of your points for uh, inside each of those distance classes. And this is done, as I told you, by something, well, by two different, uh, the, the most common uh, measures of what is called here spatial autocorrelation, or spatial of course, it, 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 uh, for the data themselves, this autocorrelation contains every uh, correlated information. Uh, the spatial correlation measures are uh, the most frequent ones are Morin's I and Gary's C. So, without having uh, going into much detail here, you have those comparisons for lags uh, between uh, pairs of points that belong to the same. Uh, distance classes, I get here a, a weight of one, the other ones again uh, uh, a zero, and then you do this for each distance class, but basically, uh, again, without commenting the formulas themselves, consider that Morin's I is very close to Pearson's R correlation, for all practical purposes it, it behaves, behaves the same way, uh, although the expectation is not strictly zero, but the value that for given amount of, uh, of uh, Observation is quite close to zero. And Gary's C behaves close to a measure of distance, actually, a measure of, uh, so, so, so the value is larger than when uh, the correlation is less or when it goes to, uh, to negative. It doesn't go to negative, but in any case, it, it behaves like uh, uh, something like a distance. So the smaller the value and the higher the, the correlation among uh, points in Gary's C. Here, it's uh, more like uh, the example I showed you before. OK? So in, in really a couple of words, this is what uh, uh, a measure of a, a correlation, a spatial correlation is, and a correlogram. But now, we deal, we, we deal with multivariate data. So how could we do this? Here is where the mantle correlogram comes uh, at the front. But of course, here again, we'll first see what a mantle test is, because this is what is behind the mantle correlogram. A mantle test has a sulfurous reputation for good reasons, because it has been used and misused in many, many circumstances. And Pierre will come back to that at the closing talk of this course tomorrow. Or I guess you, you will uh, spend quite an amount of time. So I, I, I maybe I'll shorten a couple of, uh, go over a couple of slides that mention the, 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 the main message about this. Well, what is the principle of a mental test? It's a linear com uh, correlation between dissimilarity matrices. So you take your dissimilarity matrices, you unroll them, you, you make a vector of uh, all those values uh, for the two dissimilarity matrices relating, of course, the same set of objects, and you compute a correlation. You cannot test this by the usual uh, uh, t-test, say, for Pearson's correlation because of uh, problems of dependencies. Uh, each distance in a ma dissimilarity matrix is dependent from all the others, and so on and so forth. But now, let's first go to the hypotheses. The hypothesis for a mental test, the null hypothesis, is that the dissimilarities among objects in matrix Y are not linearly uh, correlated with the corresponding dissimilarities in the other matrix. H1 being that there is a correlation uh, between the two. And uh, generally, this H1 is uh, one-tailed on the right uh, part of the, uh, of the distribution because 
uh, when something happens, then it, uh, it is that your dissimilarities uh, in, in one set is linked positively to the dissimilarity. The, the more dissimilarity your uh, objects are, dis dissimilar your objects are in one, and uh, it's likely that the, if, if anything happens, then they are more dissimilar in the other metric, uh, dis dissimilarity matrix as well. And the reverse, uh, because a reversed correlation in that case would be uh, next to impossible to, uh, to uh, interpret. So I may have to reword this into uh, one tailed uh, H1 hypothesis. The origin, well, Mantel, Nathan Mantel, published the, this test in 1967, I think, and it was about a relationship in uh, epidemiology where he tried to see whether there was a relationship between the geographical uh, distances uh, among outbreaks of, of diseases and the time separating those outbreaks. So here his thinking was really about distances, well, in, in, the, in the temporal or geographical in this case, in both matrices, and uh, at, at least so far as he was concerned, could, could not be expressed in raw data in that case. That may have to be re-inspected today, but in any case, it was uh, at this time uh, what he thought. Let's have a small example here of how it is computed. Let's start with this simple uh, Mantel statistic. Uh, and I deliberately uh, now uh, tailored a small example with one matrix with a kind of ordinary kind of dissimilarities that you may compute with a uh, Jacquardin's index or a percentage difference or whatever. And you get those dissimilarities, upper or lower, triangular. It's, of course, unimportant. They are symmetrical. And on the other side, I have here a matrix of distance classes. So you see where I will be leading to. Uh, this is the kind of right-hand matrix matrix that I shall be using in Mantel's uh, correlogram, uh, like uh, the kind of matrices uh, of distance classes we used before in the ordinary or uh, univariate correlograms. So here you have this thing. And how does it work? So the, the, the function, well, the Mantel uh, computation is really easy. You just have to multiply all those values together. So 0 0.25 times 1, which is here, uh, 0.43 times 0, and so on and so forth, through the whole matrix here, and you sum up all those values, which in this specific example give, gives uh, 1.19. This has no interest whatsoever, the value itself, except that in our case, it is the true value, meaning the observed one. And this will be compared to a, re a reference distribution that is computed by permutations. It cannot be done in a, uh, well, it I guess there is a, is there a parametric version of the mantle? Uh, I just now that I think of it, seem to have uh, seen some. Oh, it's a well, or maybe a normal approximation when you have really big, uh, big data sets. I think it's that. But the, the real one, uh, you test it by permutation. Beware, however. I told you that it was uh, corresponding to maybe you take those rows, uh, put them, uh, well, or columns, and put them. Uh, as a, as a vector, here you unroll them and you put them together to compute the, the mantle statistic. But the permutation is not done among those values. Or it, it can be done, but in a restricted way that, in fact, corresponds to permuting the original values, not the ones in the distance or the similarity matrix, but in the original data matrix. You, you, it corresponds to permuting those ones and then recomputing re the distances. So the permutable units are actually the true ob ob observed uh, the, the observations, the observations, and not the distances or the similarities themselves. But this is a technical point. And actually, the standardized mental statistic that is now used is, this time, the exact equivalent of Pearson statistics, uh, which is actually uh, a standardized way. You see that it, it, it's still uh, the same formula, but you standardize your, uh, your values by the mean and the standard deviation here. So 
for, for the, the principle. So you have now a mean of comparing dissimilarity matrices together, not comparing the raw data. But please, now, re, uh, from now on, remember that comparing dissimilarity ma matrices or comparing raw data is not the same at all. And this is the point that Pierre will be stressing tomorrow. So I'll go quickly over the following uh, warning <laughs> slides uh, uh, about this point, because Pierre will, be, will go in more detail uh, about that. Simply remember that the variance of community composition table I is not the same as the variance of a dissimilarity matrix. And this is the, the, the core of it all. Because many uh, uh, strange things have been done with mantle tests uh, in the literature. But the one application where the mantle statistic is still useful, and we, we did simulation and uh, we wrote a paper in, uh, that was published in uh, 2012. I think I forgot to put the reference here. Yeah. It's on Pierre's site in any case. I just look for that. Is the, is the, it's called something like, is the mantle correlogram useful uh, for, or for uh, ecological uh, investigation or something like that. Uh, so um, how does it work? It works the way I just showed you before for one class. So the principle is you compute a standardized mantle statistic between your dissimilarity matrix and first a matrix containing ones uh, for, well, uh, we are in dissimilarity, so uh, containing actually zeros for the class where you are, and no return that. No, otherwise it, 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 it would become negative. Okay, so for zeros, uh, where, uh, for your distance uh, class, and ones for the other one. And then you do the same, but changing and you test this, and you do the same, but changing uh, the right-hand matrix here for uh, putting the zeros and, uh, and the ones where the second class versus all the others are, and the same for the third class and the fourth class, and so on, until you, are, uh, you have covered the whole, your whole range. The expectation of the Mandel statistic, like the one uh, of Pearson statistic, is zero. So you, are, you will get uh, negative correlations or Mandel uh, statistics when you are negatively correlated and positive ones when you are positive. So it amounts to uh, interpreting the, the correlogram the same way as my first uh, intuitive example uh, shown before in the univariate case. In R, you can do this using function mantel.correlog in vegan. The only data necessary are a response dissimilarity matrix and either the geographical coordinates of the sites or a matrix of geographical distances, meaning Euclidean distance uh, 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 built upon those x, y, or x coordinates. Well, if you want to avoid problems, because uh, uh, I don't know why, but I had problems uh, last night when I, for the last time, tested this before coming to you this morning, um, it may be uh, better to provide the matrix of geographical distances instead of the raw x, y value. For the left-hand matrix, you have to provide your distance matrix anyway. But for the right-hand one, it's, it's supposed Mantel.correlog is supposed to accept the xy coordinates and uh, run the, the, the distance, uh, compute the distance ma matrix by itself. But for whatever reason, last night it, it, it didn't work. Uh, I have updated the zip file containing all our uh, practical material last night according to this, so that two days practical in my uh, version of it uh, now contain the corrected form. Uh, of course, uh, are we, uh, another point here if the data contain a linear trend. You have to detrend them before computing this uh, analysis. And this is also true for most uh, spatial analysis that we will do. Again, I told you this when I spoke about the detrending a couple of days ago. I mentioned that all those uh, sophisticated methods of data analysis actually should be 
uh, use that their full potential to detect finer scale processes and not those uh, trivial trends uh, that go over the whole range of your, of your area, okay? So you detrend them by just removing the, the, the linear trend uh, in, uh, with an LM function. That LM, in this case, works as well for whole uh, uh, matrices. So let's have an, a little example here. Uh, you see here that I work on the, the, the Zorebatid mite uh, data set. So I first transform my mite uh, data. I Hellinger transform them in this example, and then I detrend them. Look how easy it is to run a linear detrending on a data set. You just take the residuals of your linear model of uh, the, your matrix, uh, I, I have specified those here that this is supposed to be a matrix and this a data frame, but here uh, it was already, but, uh, oh, did I? Yes, yes, of course. And uh, this is now my detrending. Uh, my detrending has been done. This is a linear regression, actually, uh, one with, uh, with uh, XY coordinates. So I do this regression and I take the residuals. And these are my detrend in my data. And then I compute my correlogram here uh, with the function mantel correlog, where I take, okay, you may not have seen this way of computing a distance material. Dist, function dist, um, belongs to the base of R. And in compu it computes the Euclidean distance. So you just, uh, in this case, since I have Hellinger transform my data. Well, they have been uh, detrended after a while, but they are still Hellinger transformed. So I just compute within this, without having to uh, create intermediate objects that are useless anyway, a distance matrix from my Hellinger, uh, detrended Hellinger transform my data. And the other one being the distance. Here I have been careful. I have also computed the distance matrix, geographical distance matrix upon my XY uh, data here. And uh, I uh, then display the result. And the result, the numerical result, looks like this, where you have the classes that have been computed with automatical um, uh, lags. Uh, these have been computed internally, but you could uh, change them. And uh, it gives you the class index. Since the distances were in meters, those are the middle of, uh, of each of those classes in meters. And um, here are the number of dissimilarities in, within each class. It's uh, an important information that. And you have those mental correlation values, 0 0.13, 0 0.11. Don't be afraid by the low values of the mental correlations. It always, it's always so. Uh, so the values themselves are, are unimpo unimportant. What is important here is to see that they change signs at some point. And here they are highly... Uh, uh, significant uh, in uh, positive values, and here they become significant in negative values uh, as well. Uh, now I'll have to, well, I'll, I'll show you how it displays, but after that I have a, just a couple of words about uh, those corrected values, which are the ones you have to look for here, corrected p-values. So this is our correlogram, okay? So the values you saw before, and the, uh, here, the black squares are for the significant uh, uh, correlation, autocorrelation values or mantel correlation values, uh, and, uh, and the white ones are non-significant. In our case here, you see it looks different from the, the, my first example. It's quite typically the kind of correlogram you would obtain when you have a gradient in, in your data, because it, uh, first, at close distances, when you have a, a gradient, or something continuous in, in, your, in your surface along uh, one or a couple of axes, uh, then close, when you, when you take uh, sam uh, sampling uh, cores or whatever, in this case it was soil cores, close to one another, they are likely to resemble each other because you are in the same conditions. And then when you get farther apart, uh, the pairs of, of, uh, of cores are progressively farther apart, they become progressively different until a, a point where, since you are at a scale broad enough, 
you are likely to, when you, you, you take one core at some point and another at, uh, say, uh, five meters or three or four meters apart, you're likely to find two quite different situations, so the communities will be different as well. And this is reflected in those negative correlations here, which are significant. At the end, it tends always to level out, but this is mainly because you, you are beginning to lack uh, distances to test your... Um, your uh, spatial correlation correctly. So uh, for all practical purposes, uh, like you see here, it's even uh, not tested. At some point, you stop testing uh, because you, you, you have not enough information to do it properly. Okay? Now, just a word to finish about multiple testing. I already mentioned that topic saying, uh, compare it, uh, comparing it with uh, the throwing of dice when it was uh, uh, mentioned that if you have not one but several tests to run uh, you know, on the same situation, let's be very general here, then if each of your tests is done with a rejection level of uh, alpha 0 0.05, for instance, then uh, of course at the end you are very likely to have had at least one, if you have made enough tests, you are very likely to have at least one of those tests rejecting uh, your uh, null hypothesis by uh, why it should not have been done. This is the normal type one error of any test. So, in the case of a correlogram, you have as many tests as you have lags where you have done your test. So this is a typical case where if you simply run your test and do, don't correct your p-values or your uh, rejection level, which is uh, the same, but seeing from the opposite direction, then you're likely to uh, consider too many val values as significant. So um, the solution is to correct the level of rejection or the p-value uh, in the opposite direction, which is the same. The most drastic way of correcting those values is called the Bonferroni correction, where you divide the global th threshold of rejection of H0 by the number of tests you are doing. So in our case, the correlogram will be globally declared significant if at least one of the seven, since we had seven autocorrelation values, is significant at a corrected alpha level of 0 0.05 divided by seven, which is 0 0.007, okay? I could have done the reverse meaning. I could have multiplied the, the p-values of the test by 7 and checked against 0 0.05. Uh, you can do it both ways, of course. The, the results are completely equivalent. You can verify that globally this correction levels out the chances and you globally get the, the, the targeted uh, risk by uh, computing this. You have uh, a 1 minus 0 point. This is based on the... A binomial distribution, I won't go into detail, but if you do this computation, you check that the global chances of accepting H0, and it, it is true, is indeed uh, 0 0.95. So this is correct. However, this is a very conservative, again, no politics here, very conservative correction, <laughs> uh, meaning that it tends to uh, not reject H0 often enough. And this means you, you have a lack of power, so you have the reverse problem. It's, uh, of course, it, it is valid, but you have not so much power. So uh, other types of corrections have been uh, proposed, and this is especially the case where when the values of the, the various tests are related somehow, like in this case of the, the, the correlogram. And an interesting one is the Holm correction, which has been applied to the correlogram here. So in the Holm correction, you, you run the k-tests, uh, you order the probabilities in increasing order, beginning by the, the most, uh, uh, well, the smallest one, and you correct each significance level stepwise beginning from the, the, the first one, by dividing it by one plus the number of remaining tests in the ordered series. So how does it look like? This is my last slide for today. Uh, 
Let's say here we have six fictitious autocorrelation probability values here. Uh, six because uh, there, there was a number of uh, things I could put in this slide while having <laughs> sufficiently large uh, uh, writing here that uh, everybody can see it clearly. So let's say that this could have been uh, an, an autocorrelogram with six uh, values with probabilities uh, 1.001, etc. You see the values here. So if you don't make any corrections and you test at the 5% rejection level, you have those 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 out of 6 would be deemed significant. Okay? If you apply the Bonferroni correction, Bonferroni correction where, uh, says you have to uh, reject each uh, 0 only if the p-value is equal to or uh, smaller than 0 0.05 divided by those 6 uh, number of, of tests, okay, 6, which is 0 0.0083. So Bonferroni would uh, reject H0 only here, here, and here. And now the home correction, which is a little bit in between, not so drastic, so conservative. You order them in increasing order of probability. So you have two equal ones here at the beginning, and then it is this one, uh, and this, and this, and this. So uh, just those one sorted in increasing. And now, for each of those, you compute the threshold. So the first one is still the Bonferroni. You have seen six values here. So the, the rejection uh, level is still 0 0.0083 here. But then, for the rest of them, here you have still 5 to test. So you divide 0 0.05 by 5, which gives 0 0.01, and then by 4, by 3, by 2, and by 1. Okay, so it, it relaxes the correction uh, according to the number of tests that remaining to be done. And finally, with this one, you see that we are somewhere in between here. So we re reject H0 clearly for those two 0.001 tests here, and then still for this one and this one, but then you lose uh, that value, which is really too close to the 0 0.05 uh, level, the uncorrected level, and uh, is likely to be uh, the result of a type 1 error because of the number of tests you have done. Okay? I guess it's time to finish this morning, and I remind you, do we do it now? Okay. Everybody is now requested to go to the terrace and we uh, and have uh, her or his best smile for the group photograph. Take a lot of funny pictures up there.